Um, I'm very happy to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Laura Gagliardi. Professor Gagliardi is the Richard and Kathy Leventhal Professor in the Department of Chemistry in the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. She is also the director of an EFRC called the In the Port Gano Metallic Catalyst Design Center. Professor Gagliardi's research aims to develop novel quantum chemical methods and combine them with data science and classical simulations and apply them to study phenomena related to sustainable energies with special focus on chemical systems relevant to catalysis, spectroscopy, photochemistry, and gas separations. Um, so if we could all uh, give a round of applause for our speaker. Um, and the floor is yours, Professor Gagliardi. Omar is a part of our 
our center. And I think what is beautiful about our center is that uh, we have a few materials uh, that are really um, uh, used by different groups in the center. So we, we share them and people perform different experiments and we try to, to compare our results uh, and uh, come up with some uh, um, complete story of what we learn and uh, uh, what we learn. And so, in particular, um, we are going to look at this uh, zirconium base, a new 1000. This is uh, the framework. It has uh, two different uh, types of pores based on their size. And you see here, you, you have the, the node uh, with the linkers. So there is this node with the eight uh, linkers. So this is the topology of the framework. The node is this uh, zirconium uh, oxide node with six uh, uh, zirconia. And, uh, um, these are uh, the linkers, uh, uh, so TDA pyrene uh, linkers. So, what to, I, I will start with the initial study, which uh, actually started a couple of years ago. And so, um, the group of uh, Max Del Ferro at Argonne and uh, Alex Martinson, um, they started, they performed some uh, atomic layer deposition. Uh, to modify post synthetically uh, this framework and so to incorporate uh, um, metals. And, uh, and then when um, the, the framework was, uh, was uh, modified in this way, then they used this uh, aspect of the framework and the metal as catalyst for uh, propine isomerization and hydrogenation to propadarine and propylene, respectively. And so these are some of the um, initial results uh, that were obtained. And so here you see the uh, propadiene yield as a function of temperature and also the propadiene selectivity for a, a different set of metals. And uh, I apologize if the fonts are, are too small. You know, I forgot my glasses and I tell you that from there I can see there. So I'm lucky that I can look at my computer, otherwise I have no idea of what I'm telling you. But so, that's fine. So, um, you see here, the point is that uh, cadmium and zinc uh, show high selectivity towards the isomerization. On the other hand, copper shows very low selectivity towards isomerization. And uh, this is, uh, was done by taking this catalyst at the same conditions, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, loading and reaction conditions. And then, on the other hand, if we now look at the uh, propylene um, yield and selectivity, we, show, we see that at the top, we have copper. So copper shows high selectivity and high yields towards hydrogenation, while all the other metals uh, uh, don't. So here there is also this other picture that shows the pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, propylene conversion. And again, again, copper is at the top. So now the point is that this is a center where there are experimentalists, there are theorists, computationalists, and I'm one of them. And so the, the, the question is, okay, these are the experiments, can theory try to understand the different behavior between uh, uh, these different transition methods? And so usually what we do uh, here in the center, there are various theorists, uh, we have, for example, uh, Martin Newark, who is one of them, and here what we do is to model um, these assistants with various approaches. So first of all, we have to set up different types of models that go from the full periodic systems, because these are periodic materials, and uh, sometimes, for example, in terms of their structural information, we don't get everything from, uh, from experiments, so we have to uh, optimize the structure. But then, when we look at uh, the reductions, we try to construct more uh, cluster kind of models, so we more localized models. And the idea is that uh, we can, when we look at these uh, cluster models, so we look at them with uh, not just density functional theory, but also wave function theory. For example, when, when we have complex electronic structure situations, and we have done it, so for example, also in collaboration with Jochen Sauer and with his, uh, his group. So that's uh, the overall approach for theory. And uh, so this was a study that was performed uh, a couple of years ago by Ritish Mangahar, a student in my group, is graduating next week. And this was actually, besides Max the Ferro, so Johaki Flower was uh, the co-author. So the idea is that different metals uh, have different oxidation states uh, that are accessible. So, for example, if uh, we think uh, uh, in principle these are uh, metal 2 plus formally, but we see that uh, um, 
when you have your metal, it uh, can uh, undergo two um, different forms of hydrogen uh, splitting, either a uh, heterolytic splitting, like what is called reaction one here, uh, or a homolytic splitting. And if you have the homolytic splitting, basically your metal goes to the oxidation state one plus and uh, remains there. And so when we started looking at two dif at these different possibilities, we looked at the two extreme cases of transition metals, copper versus zinc. You see these are just electronic energies, but you see that uh, for copper, reaction two is much more favorable rather than reaction one, while for zinc, it's the other way around. So this uh, really may explain that again, these different oxidation states uh, are connected with different uh, um, processes. And uh, in particular, if one compares free energy of activations for various reactions, hydro hydrogenation versus isomerization, we see that in the zinc case, of course, the um, isomerization is, uh, is lower in energy than the hydrogenation. Uh, then you have this uh, number here for copper, but this would correspond to the heterolytic uh, splitting. While in the homolytic case, we see that the hydrogenation is much more favorable. So if we assume this doesn't happen, but the two processes that happen are the other two, we can uh, try to rationalize the difference uh, between the two metals. So to summarize uh, this uh, project, which was, a, I think it was a nice paper, I learned a lot, and um, um, it's appreciated. So what we basically learned is that uh, Different metals show different preferences, homolytic versus heterolytic. Zinc prefers the heterolytic splittings, copper prefers the homolytic splitting, and this uh, can be, this difference can be, this is due to the electronic configuration of the D9 um, metals versus the D10. This could be the deciding factor in what mechanism is followed, and it may explain the different selectivity between the two metals. And we were cautious because we use this could or may because that's the, uh, really um, what the situation is about. So what have I told you? I have told you a story of, of what I like to call the usual approach in catalysis. The experimentalists characterize a moth catalyst, the theorists come up with a model, there is some disagreement between the two, <laughs> and there are more insightful experiments, more calculation, a compelling story, and this is what we have done. <laughs> However, there are some problems with this approach. It's not scalable, sometimes the characterization is expensive and insufficient, so you cannot really do it uh, every time you change one method. And uh, um, you need some creative storytelling, creative work, you have to be good at telling the story. And so, and overall, this is difficult to transfer. You will learn a lesson from one case, does it translate well to the others? And uh, uh, so how then you, you go to the next step? So this is, I think, a problem that we, um, as a community, face. So of course, what is the solution to all of this? Of course, it's doing it data-driven high throughput, right? That's what we have been learning for the last two days. And uh, um, I want to tell you now a story which uh, we revisited this problem, including data-driven high throughput, and I want to show the progress that we have made. But I will spend the last 10 minutes of my time telling you that it's not, a, I mean, it's not that one thing is the solution to the problem by itself. But so what you basically we've done, and this is a, a recent work, from now on, what I'm going to tell, talk about is all about published. We have combined some information from catalysis synthesis, and this has been collected at Argonne with the reaction conditions, theoretical features in the traditional way that I described before, well, all of these into machine learning suggested the next experiment and the loop. And so probably, I mean, we have learned a lot of talks about machine learning. What is different uh, here is A, this is about metal organic framework catalysis, which is certainly a degree of complexity higher than other surface, for example, but also really trying to combine both the experimental data and the theories. So here, this is the, um, the, the procedure that is performed at Argon. So this is an automated synthesis uh, and uh, high throughput reactor. Uh, I will not tell you much about it because I, I don't know anything. The good thing is that Katie, uh, who is our collaborator on the project, is in the 
the audience. So if people have questions about uh, this automated synthesis, uh, uh, it is here uh, to talk to take them. And so the scope of this project uh, was to explore the activity of different metals deposited on new 1000 with the, this is a different technique, it's not ALD, it's this uh, um, organometallic chemistry, surface organo organometallic chemistry for propine uh, dynamization. And so we, from experiment, we had these kind of parameters uh, to fit in our machine learning model. Some uh, two synthesis parameters, metal identity and metal loading, and three reaction uh, conditions. So, and so this is our high throughput story. So Daniel in my group is the one who really did the, the machine learning starting from this data and from the, the, the electronic structure theory calculation. So the idea is to initialize the screening with these metals and then um, try to create a loop between the high throughput experiment and the active learning engine and then find some trends in catalytic activity and, and characterize a successful um, catalyst. And so this, uh, this is from the initial screening, the data from KG. This is the propine uh, conversion for these uh, 23 different metals uh, at this uh, uh, loading. And uh, um, this is the result of the initial screening. So here we have the maximum as the dying yield for the different transition metals. And even if uh, your, your eyesight is as bad as mine, you can see that there is a copper here, bigger winner, all the others are really poor. So copper, extremely promising, but uh, the question is, can we achieve a reasonable activity also with other metals? And how can we prioritize copper while screening other metals? So Daniel developed this uh, dual machine learning model. There is, the first part of the model is about copper. So the idea is focus only on copper and predict the optimal copper loading experimental condition using these features and then from here go to the second part of the machine learning which is about the other non-copper metals so understand which are the best what is their best loading and uh, uh, these are the features used uh, in the machine learning so let's look at the machine learning optimization for copper so he defined some experimental parameter space he projected these uh, uh, parameters on the PCA uh, eigenvectors uh, uh, of the collected data, and we have learned a lot about PCA. And, and then he formed the search grid, uh, it is the principal component analysis space. So, for example, you see here these are the experimental data, this is projected um, experimental parameter space, and the PCA grid. So, we have this. Uh, these variables that are a linear combination of all these um, parameters, experimental parameters. And then from here, he can uh, predict a yield uh, using the uh, k nearest neighbor model, which is a very simple, it's basically a, really an interpolation model. And you see here you have this, uh, this picture that shows the the yield percent as a function of these two vectors in the PCA space. And now, when we have this, um, this outcome, we can suggest the next experiment. So these are all the, the purple points are the uh, experiments that were performed by KG, and the yellow point is the one that uh, um, suggested based on this outcome. And so these are the, the conditions, the experimental conditions, and of course, KG run uh, these, uh, the experiment in this condition. And then from what we learned on copper, we went to the, uh, the other transition methods, and now we can screen only um, 16 methods loading at a time. This is a technical aspect of the project. So we cannot really say, okay, we try all conditions for all methods at the same time. So we have to interpolate in this uh, model between metals uh, in order to make new predictions. And so we need also some metal features so that correlate uh, with the yield. And uh, uh, to do so, um, what uh, was suggested, this is actually, this work was first uh, performed for a completely different type of project by KG. But the idea is to look at some atomic features, so these are tabulated data, they have nothing to do with our calculations like, for example, atomic number, atomic weight, electronegativity, the number of valence electrons, and the position in the periodic table, and so on. So, for each 
atom, we have these features. And then there are the DFT calculations. So, and here is where Sawmill um, performed these calculations. So he, he used, he set up these cluster models, uh, as I've shown you in the past. So the standard approach. And uh, he looked at uh, reactions for different spin states and he tried to identify the lowest spin state for each reaction. And uh, then uh, he obtained data related to, for example, the absorption analysis of uh, hydrogen and protein. So in total so far, and this is unpublished, it's unfinished, I would say, we have 13 uh, DFT features per metal. So now, with these features, uh, um, experimental, um, the fixed experimental parameters, the metal loading, one per metal, the atomic features, 22 per metal, and 33, 13 DFT uh, data, um, what uh, um, Daniel has used is this uh, X-Reduced tree based regression model, and uh, um, the idea is uh, to predict uh, metal yields uh, and suggestion. And so this is a larger feature space, so there are some missing DFT data, so this uh, approach is certainly more powerful than the PCA that we used before. And so, these are our results. Okay, so um, current best performance. So these are all the experiments that uh, Katie collected. So we are talking about 1,013 data. Most of them are related to copper, but you see the distribution of the other metals. And uh, here you see the maximum exadine yield. And uh, copper, I mean, it was high uh, at the beginning, but after this iterative procedure that it awaited many times, you see copper is, a, is a pretty high, 25%. And so I want to show you the beginning versus the end. The, the initial screening was this one. And you see we have just copper at about 16%. Now, after this iterative procedure, we have uh, uh, copper at 25%. And also palladium and nickel uh, are about uh, uh, 10, between 5 and 10. So now I could uh, end my lecture, but I have my last uh, um, 10, uh, 15 minutes in which I want to try to rationalize what we have learned, where we are here, and uh, how can we move forward. So what did we gain? And I will try to talk about it maybe from the point of view of the theorists. Maybe some of the things that I've said are so trivial for experimentalists, but uh, from theorists, uh, at least in the traditional approach in catalysis, uh, all what this has taught us is, uh, is not so necessarily so obvious. So the first thing is that, uh, I mean, if we think about the, the initial work of British, he set up his model, which was reasonable, and he explained the difference between two uh, different oxidation states. But it's very hard for a theorist uh, to model a realistic uh, reaction and synthesis condition. I want to show you again, this is our the copper data. You see in this uh, plot, uh, the area, the, the dark uh, um, area is, is really uh, narrow. So we have this Goldilocks region, and in principle, if we want to really see how the catalyst uh, predict how the catalyst work, we should model these conditions. And if you see here, you can see here the, uh, the frequency of the yield, so yield distribution. And most of the, the measurements give zero yield. So there are very, very few cases where you have a high yield. And you can say, OK, I can reach this type of knowledge by setting up a microkinetic model. Maybe it's the case, but probably this uh, combining with the data I think with and machine learning is an accelerated way of obtaining the same result. And also, um, I want to show you that, uh, again, why is it difficult to, to set up a model that works at this condition? Because, you see, this is a very big catalyst. It works at uh, uh, this high yield, only here, which corresponds to a loading of two, which means uh, uh, two copper per um, node of month, more or less, and a, a H2 uh, com uh, concentration of 20%. Uh, if you go to um, too higher loading and too much uh, H2, the, the catalytic activity is killed. So in a way, uh, one either arrives to this uh, by, by doing more experiment, by doing microkinetic modeling, or otherwise, every modeling is a little bit of a sort of 
fictional uh, uh, exercises. And also, um, if you look at the uh, extra line yield as a function of the um, loading, you see this is a sort of volcano plot. You have uh, this, uh, uh, this maximum here. Uh, and so this is again uh, an extremely diff difficult behavior to model computationally. Finally, if we look, for example, at uh, yield versus selectivity for copper, you see that the, so this on the left is yield, on the right is selectivity. The two uh, super dark uh, uh, regions are, are quite separated. So the question is, when I set up a model, do I want to focus on yield or do I want to focus on uh, selectivity? And then I told you that uh, the point was not just to study copper, but to look also at other uh, transition metals. And so nickel was one of the metals uh, that uh, um, was uh, behaving quite promising. And you can see, okay, the, the darker region with the highest yield is very different for copper and nickel. And so again, the point is that if I want my model to be transferable, and let's say that I'm successful here, it will not be so straightforward to be successful in the nickel case, because uh, uh, they, they really um, behave in a very different uh, uh, so what about uh, this catalyst? I mean, I haven't really told you anything about uh, their structure. And uh, well, the, the reason is that, um, you know, in the copper case, this is the uh, experiment by, by, uh, by Katie, this uh, elemental mapping. It basically shows four the different species, but this uh, um, um, area here is about the copper. And what you see is that uh, what is present in this catalyst are um, these large copper nanoparticles, uh, large copper clusters uh, that are inside uh, the core. And uh, this is probably the reason why this catalyst uh, is also so active, because uh, you have the formation of nanoparticles, uh, uh, which, uh, um, on the other hand, maybe it doesn't happen in the uh, you know, larger transition metals. And so, um, again, um, if we didn't know this, I mean, we didn't know it at the beginning, and so we, I will show you that uh, the modeling has to catch up uh, uh, from this uh, information. So, at the end, I told you, okay, it was quite successful, at least in, in terms of increasing the yield in the catalyst, uh, thanks to this iterative procedure, and also we learned quite a lot. And I said machine learning helped a lot, and it's true, but at the same time, I want to tell you, what are really the, the strengths and the limitations of machine learning? Because I don't think this is the, the solution to all our problems, at least it will not replace all the other aspects. And so here the actual story is that uh, this project has been going on for a year, uh, and here you see the maximum yield as a function of time. So this is where the various experiments were run. So we started about a year ago, May uh, 21, and now we are at May 22. And basically, there was four months of no luck with machine learning data suggestion. So I told you, all machine learning was great, but it started picking up later on. At the beginning, it was a total failure. And why was this so the case? Because we started this uh, process by exploring the hydrogen concentration that was uh, too low. So at the beginning, I mean, an executive decision was made to look at this uh, region of hydrogen concentration and instead of to collect the final set of data, we, we, we moved to, by like Katie, looked at a much higher, uh, and uh, Daniel uh, used those much higher concentration data in his machine learning model. So basically, what was important, here you see the, the yield as a function of time and the maximum hydrogen concentration. So KG, uh, in September 15 of 2021, made an executive decision and said, okay, let's move to this larger hydrogen concentration space, and finally the results started uh, improving a lot. I still have uh, uh, time, right? Okay, I have uh, maybe four or five more minutes. One minute? No. Four, five, okay. So, basically, we can say that machine learning can interpolate well within a space, but it can never tell you uh, the space, whether the space uh, is uh, good or wrong to begin with. And so at some point, the human has to make an executive decision. And so that's why we don't, we will not be able to replace all our students uh, with computers. <laughs> so the other thing is that, uh, uh, let's say, this is the first thing, so executive decisions have to be made, but also, um, machine learning okay, gives you data, but it can tell, can 
can tell you the, the bread and butter story. So, for example, here you see uh, this is the experiment, the, and this is the distribution of the data. So, trying to connect this with this distribution is something that, again, the human has to do. So, I think this is a very important aspect. Now, concerning the, the traditional computations, so what can regular computational modeling do or not do? So, Sonal explored, in Jesus, this beautiful mechanism. Uh, it computed all the structures, uh, with the different spins, but you see these are all monocopper centers, monocopper atoms. And uh, he basically uh, came up with this beautiful um, delta G as a function of the reaction coordinate plot, where it shows that the hydride insertion is the kinetically uh, relevant step. But of course, uh, now we know that uh, the catalyst is in the form of nanoparticles, and these are the relevant species. So, in a way, the question is. I think it's important to also to do the work on the monocopter, but uh, you will really need this iterative procedure in now some calculations on the nanoparticles that uh, uh, are underway. Moreover, as I already said before, I mean, the catalyst is very picky. It really allows this loading and H2 concentration uh, condition. So, how can a computation be, pre be predicted when the catalyst uh, uh, is, uh, is so picky? And even now that we know, uh, that uh, we want this uh, two, two loading. I mean, how can we model it? What does uh, a loading of two really mean? So, with that, I hope I have uh, uh, shown you how this iterative procedure works and uh, uh, the, how, how possible it is to make fast progress, but at the same time, keep in mind what the various limitations are. And so, these are my conclusions and outlook. So the reaction and synthesis parameters are critical to mass catalysis, and this is both a blessing and a curse. It's hard to model computationally alone, but uh, I mean it can help to tell a convincing story, uh, and so you need to use these computations with uh, machine learning and high throughput data. But at the same time, one has to be cautious at using the machine learning uh, uh, outcome. Because sometimes we are really exploring in a relevant region, so we need to know when it's time to make a change. At the end of the day, what is most important is that this self sustained loop between experiment, computation, and data science. So, this may be the machine learning is something more modern than all the others, but it's important it's what allows us to make the quantum leaps in advancing catalyst discovery. And uh, as a group, I mean, we have learned a lot by studying this catalysis. What we are trying to do now as a team is to move in a different direction in terms of the catalytic uh, systems that we're studying, and they are catalyst uh, relevant to decarbonization. So they are still with, uh, with framework based, but the idea is that now we look at more softer frameworks uh, with more polarizable components, and we look at uh, uh, different reactions, uh, some of them are also electrocatalytic uh, reactions, which means that they have even more degree of complexity because there is a solvent, there is a potential, and so on. With that, I'd like to thank uh, the people who um, make this research possible. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the four young ones that are um, trained in red. I mean, they are the ones who did really all the work. Katie, uh, I learned so much uh, um, uh, from her about the experiment. I, I think I need to uh, your lab for a test crash course. And these are the, the theories, the machine learning people in the group. So Will is here with us today. Daniel and Rudish are not here. And then, of course, this project was done in collaboration with Max De Ferro and Omar Farah. And the whole EFRC effort. Uh, is also done in collaboration with uh, Johannes, who was involved in the first part of the project. Johannes, uh, Mark, um, Matt Newark, and uh, Ilya Sipman. And uh, I'm very lucky to work with many people from all over the world. Uh, this is really a privilege, especially in these uh, difficult times. And uh, while many of your questions, I'm happy to take them. But I want to advertise this talk by Sonil uh, on Friday. This is about a collaboration instead with uh, um, much more of Johannes Urcher on uh, this. Uh, this is about uh, diamond, olefin diamondization. And you have to stay for the talk after mine. This is from a uh, Fabian Berger, and uh, this talk will be amazing. So please don't leave after mine. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes. Uh, I have a friend who had more joy of 